is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. I'm really happy to be to have Bob as a speaker because um, when I started in the roundtable business in D.C. at, at the old Capitol Hill, he, uh, when I became the program chairman there, I took over for Bob. And so he, I got all the contacts and everything and how to do this basically from Bob. And then he left to go write this book. And now he's back. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Bob Plum was born and... Um, he was born and raised in upstate New York. He received his education from uh, grade school there and graduate school. And between his undergraduate and graduate education, he served as an officer in the Navy. Initially uh, was in the Atlantic fleet, later in a patrol boat with a crew of six in Vietnam. Uh, following grad school, Mr. Plum worked for uh, General Electric in the US and international markets, specializing in marketing programs. And he worked for 26 years with, for GE, and he worked for Fannie Mae here in DC in senior marketing and management positions till retiring. Uh, he began researching and writing uh, what would become uh, his first book called Your Brother in Arms, A Union Soldier's Odyssey. Second book was Better Angels, which we're gonna be discussing tonight. Uh, he received a BA in history from the State University of New York in Buffalo and a master's uh, from Syracuse and he attended uh, the Yale Writers Workshop in residence in 2014 through 17. And in 2019, he specialized in nonfiction and historical fiction writing. Uh, he's a member of the American Battlefield uh, Preservation Trust. And of course, he's a member of this round table and the Montgomery County Round Table and the Montgomery County Historical Society as well as its uh, Speakers Bureau and the Society of Civil War Historians. So uh, without any further ado, let me uh, have our speaker uh, begin, Bob Plum. Thank you very much, John. And it's true, a number of years ago, uh, I was the, the guy that went out and got speakers for the Capitol Hill Civil War Roundtable. And then this book came up and uh, I asked John if he'd be willing to pick up that responsibility. And I'm sure he thought at the time, oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to go write a book, pal. So now you can <laughs> see there actually was a book. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here this evening. Thanks for inviting me. Um, actually, this book got started when I was working on my last book. The last book was based on 42 letters from a Union soldier who served with the 155th Pennsylvania. And, you know, like most beginning writers, I went out and just jumped into every archive and uh, all the different things that I could find where I could learn about the battles that this particular soldier was in. I went on numerous uh, guided tours, uh, spent time, lots of time on the battlefield, and I kept coming across the names of these women we're going to talk about tonight. And with the exception of probably one, they're all very well-known women, and there have been lots of books written about them, but nobody ever looked at them and how they sort of fit into the Civil War timeline. And I was fascinated by that. And the more I dug into it, uh, the more I realized there was a real story here. And, uh, you know, the, despite the fact that probably since third grade, we've read about Clara Barton, there were some things I discovered that I thought were really interesting and were not well known. Um, so if we can have the next slide, I decided I would call this book based on Lincoln's present uh, statement in his first inaugural where he talked about the mystic boards of memory um, and things he knew were going to get bad, but he said that they would be touched by the better angels of our nature. And I've discovered since I'd done this book, I think everybody and his brother, um, including Joe Biden and uh, Barack Obama, have used better angels in one way yes. or another. Uh, so I, I, I take no credit other than the fact that it just was a very appealing name for me. And I believe, as I looked at these women, their efforts and their contributions came along the Civil War timeline exactly when they were when they were needed uh, and most urgently. So if we have the next slide, 
Let me introduce you to them. The first we're gonna talk, uh, I will spend more time talking about um, uh, the next slide so you can see who I'm talking about. Yeah, Harriet Tubman. She is a liberator of the enslaved, first herself and then 80 plus enslaved people over 14 rescue missions conducted over a decade, actually the antebellum decade. And she also played a role during the war. But the thing we know her most about is what she did um, helping others escape from slavery in Dorchester County, Maryland. The next person we're gonna talk about, and one of the five better angels, so I get the next slide please, is Harriet Beecher Stowe. She wrote a profoundly moving narrative of the lives of enslaved people. She was one of our first, what I would call literary provocateurs who used literature to bring attention to a wrong too long tolerated in the nation. And she sort of paved the way for other authors that I'll briefly mention later in this presentation. She was the first who really used the literary genre as a way of explaining the problems that we were facing in, in the area of uh, enslavement. The next person I'm going to talk about is, um, next slide please, is Julia Ward Howe. And uh, she was an inspirer of a cause that helped bring the Union out of a period of profound pessimism. Her words in the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which you see displayed here for the first time, uh, helped rally the North around a noble purpose with the words, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. Amen. And her words to encourage hope, the trumpet that never calls retreat. One thing before we leave this slide, I'll point out, you see how she's identified here. That this was part of her problem for most of her adult life. Um, here she is, Mrs. Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe, not Julia Ward Howe. It took a long time for Julia Ward Howe to get her name uh, in front of her husband. He was a bit of a tyrant um, <laughs> and uh, prevented her from doing a number of things in some cases, but uh, she wore him down eventually. The next person I'm going to talk about, no, no uh, surprise here, is Clara Barton. And this person who was a former teacher and a U.S. patent office clerk overcame daunting discrimination as she struggled to overcome the shortcomings of the Army's medical corps by providing medical supplies when and where they were needed. You know, many times we've been told that uh, she was a nurse and she certainly did nursing duties, but I believe her real genius was not as sexy a term, but she was a medical supply logistics expert. And that's where I think she made a huge difference. And not to mention the fact that she put herself in harm's way consistently while she was delivering supplies. The next person I'm going to talk about is probably the least known. This is a woman who, um, if you read the Wall Street Journal, her uh, efforts to promote Thanksgiving were covered, I think, in last week's Wall Street Journal. Uh, Sarah Josepha Hale was a nationally known magazine editor who used her power as a communicator to convince Lincoln that reconciliation between North and South could be helped, be helped, not solved, but helped by observing a national day of Thanksgiving every year. Uh, this would be a time, Hale said, when regional differences between North and South could be set aside mm. and the nation would celebrate uh, its shared aspirations and give thanks. It would be a day of celebration in, in uh, Hale's mind that would be every bit as important as the 4th of July. And President Lincoln did agree with her. Before we leave this slide, I just want to, this slide right after Thanksgiving was instituted as a national holiday done by uh, Thomas Nast, uh, who himself was a immigrant from Germany, this in Harper's Weekly. And you can see, see sitting around the table are not the pilgrims that somehow we become, and become fascinated by, but Uncle Sam serving turkey to this diverse group of people, diverse ages, ethnicities, um, quite a, quite a uh, spread of America that even holds up well, I think, in the year 2020. And of course, inside we have um, come one, come all, free and equal, universal suffrage, and across the back, interestingly enough, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Lady Justice, George Washington, Lady Liberty, and General Grant, who was the president when um, Nass drew this photograph, uh, did this uh, illustration. Uh, and then in the back, very interesting, uh, 
it's a painting of a place called Castle Garden, which was the precursor to Ellis Island. So I, I think in one very crisp um, cartoon, as it was called back in those days, Thomas Nast was able to capture everything that Sarah Josepha Hale was trying to accomplish with her thoughts about Thanksgiving. So if we have the next slide, we'll get into some detail on these five women. In 1849, Harriet Tubman, who was born into slavery 27 years earlier, decided she would take steps to free herself along with her two brothers, Henry and Ben Ross. Uh, they started out from Dorchester County, Maryland on the Eastern shore near the town of Cambridge. Um, Harriet was married to John Tubman at the time. Um, she was the Ross before she married John Tubman, but he refused to accompany her uh, on this flight to Liberty. He was a free black man, and his concern was that as he went north with her, um, the distinction between a free black man and an enslaved black man would be lost somewhere along the line. He just didn't want to make that kind of, a, didn't want to take that kind of a risk, so he did not go with her. Um, in antebellum America, the distinction between free and enslaved African Americans was not recognized south, certainly of the Mason-Dixon line, and even in many cases in the north. Unfortunately, soon after departing for the North, Harriet Tubman's two brothers uh, decided to turn back. They thought that the consequences of being captured much outweighed the freedom that they might enjoy if they were successful. But she continued on and she had no GPS system. Uh, she used the North Star and the local waterways, which she was very familiar with in Dorchester County as a marker for her escape to freedom. It was uh, an incredible act of bravery and fortitude that uh, was remarkable in a way that this young woman planned and executed her flight to freedom over three states. And even more remarkable that she came back 14 more times to Dorchester County to guide up to about 80 people. Uh, sometimes the history here is a, little, uh, is a little vague on the exact number, but a number of historians have looked at it and the number 80 seems to resonate uh, with, with all the serious scholars uh, of Harriet Tubman. Uh, every subsequent trip along her way on the what became known as the Underground Railroad, uh, the stakes, of course, became higher and higher each time um, it got discovered. And there were a couple of things that happened in the meantime. Um, slave owners were becoming much more rigorous in hiring people to go out and find escaped slaves. And also in 1850, as I'm sure all of you know, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed by Congress that uh, required enslaved people who liberated themselves or were liberated by others to be returned under penalty of law. It was now a crime to aid an escaping enslaved person, even in the Northern states. So with this cover of federal law and generous rewards that were be given to, uh, for, to slave catchers, um, this raised the stakes considerably for Harriet Tubman every time she came back more people to the North. Uh, and she started out bringing them uh, from Maryland in Dorchester County through um, Delaware and up through Pennsylvania and generally to New York State. But at the time that the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, she thought it was more safe, and she was right, to bring them the few extra miles to get across the Canadian border, uh, an area named St. Catharines, Ontario, very close to New York State. And the Canadians did not recognize the Fugitive Slave Act and refused to extradite people who, uh, who participated in it. Interestingly, one ardent abolitionist, John Brown, was so impressed with Harriet Tubman's skill and her courage that he visited her in Canada and tried to recruit her to join him on his Harper Ferry, Harper's Ferry Raid in 1858. For a number of reasons, um, probably the two primary reasons uh, Harriet Tubman refused to go with him is, first of all, she had helped her parents escape and they were living with her in St. Catharines, Canada. And she didn't feel like leaving her elderly parents for some long period. And she also checked with her good friend, Frederick Dulles, who had spent a lot of time with John, Brown. John Brown. And his opinion was, quote, the raid was not well thought out and was doomed to failure. And of course, Douglas was absolutely right about that. The next slide, please. This, by the way, that last slide you saw was one of the earliest photographs that, uh, that we have of Harry Tubman. It was collected uh, a number of years ago, given to the Library of Congress and shared with the uh, African American Museum. This is, as you recognize, a carte de visite uh, of Harry Tubman, a bit older than that last you saw. 
Uh, during the Civil War, Harriet Tubman played an important role in a raid on Confederate stores in South Carolina going up the Columbia River. She helped guide Union troops and played a key role in bringing hundreds of enslaved people out of that area of the raid. Not a single casualty resulted from this aggressive foray into Confederate held territory. Uh, as I mentioned during the beginning, one of the angels was, uh, did, did uh, carry a firearm and it was Harriet Tubman. She carried a, a firearm on the Cohen B raid. Uh, whether or not she ever fired it is un, unrecorded. The interesting thing is that uh, they got deep into Confederate territory. They freed these enslaved people and they got out with a number of stores uh, and never lost a single person. Not a single person was lost in this raid. Amen. Her legacy has been her track record of successfully liberating enslaved people under the most difficult of circumstances with absolutely meager resources. Uh, she accom accomplished so much with so little. Uh, during the antebellum period, she laid rest to the claim in some quarters, which we find incredible to believe today, but nevertheless, that enslaved people chose slavery because it guaranteed food, shelter, and work. As Harriet Tubman once said, quote, now I've been free and I know what a deadful, dreadful condition slavery is. I have seen hundreds of escaped slaves, but I never saw one who was willing to go back and be a slave, end of quote. After the Civil War, Harriet Tubman involved herself in a number of causes, helping elderly indigent African-Americans um, and also participated in women's suffrage she died in March 1913 in Auburn, New York at the age of 91. Uh, she came back south from uh, Ontario uh, once the Civil War was over and she lived uh, successfully in Auburn, New York uh, and died there uh, a local uh, hero um, because of her involvement in the Civil War. The next slide, please. Harriet Beecher Stowe, she was a true blue Connecticut Yankee born in the heart of New England in Litchfield, Connecticut. The young Harriet Beecher uh, flourished in school and she studied mathematics, Latin and science which wasn't usual for females in those days. She went from the Litchfield Female Academy and, and then later studied at Hartford Female Seminary where she won recognition as a writer of fir first rate compositions. She became the editor of the school paper she was the daughter of a minister, she was the sister of a minister, and she became the spouse of a minister, Calvin Ellis Stowe, who was a theology professor at Lane Theologically, Theological Seminary, where her father was the president. And this was in, uh, in the outskirts of Cincinnati, Ohio. Their family moved out there and then Harriet uh, met Calvin and it was love at first sight and uh, she kept the, uh, she kept the uh, religious aspect of uh, her husband in the, in the family, him being a, uh, an ordained minister. After her marriage, Stowe began writing. It was published in three monthly magazines on a regular basis. Uh, but her magnus, magnum opus, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was to come a little bit later. She was living in Cincinnati with her husband, Calvin, and they began to see the results of slavery more clearly than she ever saw them in New England, obviously. Both she and her husband were active participants in the local Underground Railroad. The second influence that pushed her to write Uncle Tom's Cabin was the passage of the Compromise of 1850 and the Fugitive Slave Act. They both uh, infuriated Harriet Beecher Stowe. Mm -hmm. Now the couple's actions to help enslave people to freedom were subject to an arrest and indictment. Next slide, please. She began writing a story uh, to be published as a monthly serial yeah. in an anti-slavery magazine. She drew on sources such as Theodore Wells' American Slavery as it is, Josiah Henson's The Life of Josiah Henson, formerly a slave, and her own personal experiences and contacts in Cincinnati that she and her husband experienced there. From June 1851 through April 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin appeared weekly to a growing number of eager readers. It was so popular that in March of 1852, Stowe had a book contract with John P. Jewett Publishing House. Uh, the first week Uncle Tom's Cabin was released, it came off the press, it sold 10,000 copies. A year after its release, the book sold 300,000 copies, which I can tell you even in the year 2020, um, authors would jump through many hoops to get even a fraction of that kind of uh, coverage and, and uh, distribution. Praise and criticism, of course, for Uncle Tom's Cabin came immediately. 
To address the negative criticism that questioned the accuracy of the book, that she had that it was totally fictional and, or that she had exaggerated things, she wrote a reasoned act-based response, which she titled A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. What she did was align the things that she had written in the book and then on the opposite page, almost like a lawyer's brief, justified why those things were in fact truth and not exaggerations. Her facts are examples of real people and other source material that she cited in this document and quickly quelled most of the criticism. It's reported that when uh, Stowe visited the White House in 1862, Lincoln said to her, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that made this great war. Stowe's legacy is as the first successful author of a novel of social justice. We think of others that followed after her, such as Upton Sinclair's The Jungle about the meatpacking industry in Chicago, and John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath about migrant workers. They all followed the <clears throat> that uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe had put together, which was a compelling narrative uh, to uncover something that needed to, to be examined and explored further. Julie Ward Howe grew up leading a very privileged and isolated life in a large opulent house in the top of Manhattan. Her mother died in 1824, leaving the five-year-old Julia the focus of her father's smothering attention. He was a strict Calvinist and her father, Samuel, shielded her, his young daughter from any influences outside the house he felt would corrupt her, her education, her friends, and her life experiences were tightly controlled. They all had to go through the tight screen of Samuel Ward. When Julia was 22, she met a dashing young physician who seemed a perfect fit for this fairy tale existed. Samuel Gridley Howe, MD, was even a knight. He was a chevalier of the Order of St. Savior, a title bestowed on him by the Greek government for his mm -hmm. service during the Greek War of Independence from the Turks. However, what Julia Ward Howe quickly realized that she had gone from one gilded cage overseen by Samuel Ward, her father, to another gilded cage controlled by Samuel Gridley Howe. It was clear that Dr. Howe wanted a woman who would bear his children, be devoted to child rearing and domestic duty. He did not, he did not want an aspiring poet that his wife longed to be, but Julia Ward Howe persevered. In 1848, some of her poems were published in the volume Female Poets in America. And much to her husband's dismay, she submitted a group of poems in 1853 that were published as a volume titled Passion Flowers. Despite receiving glowing praise from literary notables such as Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Dr. Howe was furious. Even the favorable reviews from the literary establishment and the popular reception by the public for the poems did not change her husband's position on this. It didn't help that the fact that the same publishing house that published pa Passion Flowers, Julia's book, had turned down Dr. Howe's manuscript a number of months before that, saying that it didn't have broad enough appeal. Uh, this is obviously something that set the couple at, at each other. The next slide, please. The couple was undergoing a tense very strained relationship when Julia Ward Howe accompanied her husband to Washington, D.C. as he attended to his duties as a member of the Sanitary Commission, an organization established, as you know, to help improve medical conditions for the troops in their camps. They stayed at Willard's Hotel during their trip to Washington in November of 1861. And while Dr. Howe was meeting with the Sanitary Commission, Julia and her pastor, James Freeman Clark, and some friends who had accompanied the Howes to Washington decided to visit Union troops in Northern Virginia, just across the Potomac. There the group saw the troops in encampment and as they marched. Julia Ward Howe was struck by the youth of the soldiers and their exuberance as they marched singing John Brown's body. As Howe's entourage made its way- in the grave. Moldering in the grave, yes. As Howe's entourage made it back to Willard's Hotel, Reverend Clark, suggested that perhaps Julia, as an accomplished published poet, could write a better version of the marching song with more appropriate lyrics rather than leaving John Brown moldering in his grave. That night, Julia Ward Howe awoke to write a poem about her impression of seeing the troops on the march during the prior day. She wrote quickly, 
She put verses down on sanitary commission paper by lamplight in her room. And when she awoke in the morning, she made some minor changes to her poem, but she was satisfied that the work conveyed her feelings and she thought it was inspired. After her return home from Washington, she sent a copy to the editor of Atlantic Monthly and editor James Field quickly responded, said he wanted to run the poem uh, in the magazine. And it appeared as you saw earlier in the presentation in the February 1862 issue of Atlantic Monthly as the battle hymn of the Republic. The hymn sung to, to the tune of John Brown's body quickly spread in the North. The moving lyrics and, and the marching tempo were favored by the troops. For both the troops and the civilian public in the North, the battle hymn captured a feeling of a no, noble cause that had been absent at the beginning of the war. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free, was really the poetic expression of what the Emancipation Proclamation had set forth. And the lyrics, the trumpet that never calls retreat, carried with them a new resolve for, for victory. Julia Ward Howe took up many other causes after the Civil War, pacifism, women's suffrage, the abolition of the death penalty, for example. But her battle hymn legacy continued. Years after the war, when Howe addressed her audiences on the variety of these causes that I just mentioned, there was always a request at the conclusion of her talk for her to sing the battle hymn. One reporter covering her talk, uh, I believe it was a Boston reporter said, when the grand old woman of America sang the anthem, there was not a dry eye in the house. Julie Ward Howe died in 1910 at the age of 91. Next slide, please. Clara Barton began her professional career at age 18 as a teacher in her home state of Massachusetts. And soon after gaining some experience and wanting a change in location, it's still a little bit hazy of why she wanted a change. Some said it was a boyfriend in uh, New Jersey. She moved to Bordentown, New Jersey to work at a school that was facing challenges with its male students. The boys in the school were falling behind in their studies and they were not motivated by their teachers. Barton succeeded in turning the situation around so that both male and female students achieve success. As a footnote, one story Barton told years later was that how she was treating a wounded soldier on a battlefield. The young soldier said to her, do you remember me, Miss Barton? I was in your class in New Jersey. Barton's effort in Bordentown began to pay off and the school flourished under her leadership. School board then decided the growing school needed a male principal to run things. They brought in a man at a higher salary than Barton made and put him in charge. Not surprisingly, Clara Barton quit the school, discouraged by her treatment based on her gender, not her competence. A footnote to history, that male principal that they board brought in was sacked four months after uh, Clara Barton left because of his incompetence. Clara Barton applied for and was offered a clerk position uh, in the US Patent Office in Washington. And once again, Barton found that being a female in a all male bastion was uh, challenged her resolution. Her skills and effectiveness were resented by some of her male co-workers, but she persisted. And when the war started, she began to channel her efforts to help union troops from her home state of Massachusetts. Quickly, she built a network of key political contacts in Washington, including Senator Henry Wilson from Massachusetts. Using her local contacts in New England to donate and collect supplies, she leveraged her political contacts to gain access to the Army Quartermaster Corps, which became her delivery mechanism for getting medical supplies to the field. Next slide, please. Following the battles of Bull Run and Cedar Mountain, Barton was able to get much needed supplies to Fairfax Station, Virginia, where the wounded were taken from those battles. But then seeking closer proximity to the battlefield, she brought supplies to the battlefield to the battlefield at Antietam in September of 1862. She once said her place was right behind the cannon. Later in the war, she brought supplies to Fredericksburg, Virginia, again on the battlefield, and Fort Wagner in South Carolina. Once again, she was present on those battlefields. We've been told for many years that Clara Barton was a nurse, and yes, she did, in my view, perform excellent nursing duties, but her primary expertise was getting medical supplies where they were needed during a time when the Army Medical Corps was not able to keep up with the demands of the casualties, both the extent and the number of the casualties. 
She was an expert at logistics and this essential skill led to her interest and her qualifications in the area of disaster relief when she launched the American Red Cross. She was very adept at working through the political processes from her experience during the Civil War. Um, and she used this expertise to lobby the US Senate to ratify the Treaty of Geneva in 1882. That was a necessary prerequisite in order to establish a Red Cross in the United States. No uh, Treaty of Geneva. Hmm? No Treaty of Geneva. There could be no Red Cross in the United States. So that, uh, that she accomplished. She lived to age 90. She died in April of 1912 in Glen Echo, Maryland. And probably most of you, if not all of you, have been to her house and her, her warehouse, which were one and the same. Sarah Josepha Hale closes out the Better Angels uh, on the Civil War timeline. Her contribution was the initiation of a national day of Thanksgiving that superseded in her mind regional differences and began the process of national reconciliation. For years, Hale had lobbied and written to state leadership and made appeals to four sitting US presidents to proclaim a national day of Thanksgiving. None of those four presidents responded to her suggestion. Then after writing to Abraham Lincoln on September 28th, 1863, the president proclaimed the last Thursday in November as a day of Thanksgiving. And within a week of recent, that was within a week of receiving uh, Sarah Josepha Hale's letter. Hale in the mid 19th century was a prominent editor, first of a book called the Ladies Magazine, Lady, and later late, uh, Godies, Ladies, which was a national magazine that had uh, very high circulation. She used her publications platforms to promote women's higher education. She raised money to help fund Gap Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. And she raised funds for the Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon Ladies Association to restore a badly deteriorating Mount Vernon. She also played an active role in establishing the Ladies Medical Missionary Society and promoting the Female Medical College of Philadelphia. The next slide. She accomplished these worthy projects while running one of the nation's most popular national magazines. And she, she rose from being a widowed mother of five in her mid thirties to editing a highly regarded magazine where she worked with notable authors, authors such as Harriet Beecher Stowe, Edgar Allan Poe and William Cullen Bryant. She continued to work as an editor until 1877 when she stepped down as editor of the ladies book at age 89. And she died two years later at age 91. While she had over 50 years experience editing two major national magazines, she always considered her greatest achievement was helping create a national day of Thanksgiving backed by a presidential proclamation. Daniel Webster said in discussing the founders of the US, we would benefit from contemplating their example and studying their character. So I'd like to take just a minute to run through with you what I think the Better Angels shared eight characteristics. So we can bring up the next slides and they'll just come up in sequence here. The first being, they all demonstrated persistence. Once they started something, um, they didn't give up until they had achieved what they wanted to. So if we could add that slide, but there we go, there's persistence, courage. The courage uh, of being on the battlefield, as well as courage of someone like Sarah Josepha Hale, who uh, was a widow at age 34, never remarried, and managed to raise her five children successfully and have a career as a successful editor. Self-assurance, they all went into their various endeavors, assured that they could accomplish what they set out to do. They were persuasive, the next slide, uh, both persuasive in written word and also in speaking. All of them went on the speaking circuit after the war was over. They were assertive and they were compassionate, uh, whether it was compassion for enslaved people or compassion for uh, wounded soldiers on the battlefield. All of them to one extent or another uh, had a compassionate attitude towards their work. They had self-discipline. They were all, in a sense, freelancers, um, with the exception of Sarah Josepha Hale. She worked for the publisher. Uh, his name was Louis Godey, but she pretty much ran the show. So uh, she was sovereign in the sense that uh, they, they were all sovereign in the sense that they were um, 
we think of that as being kind of a national thing, but they demonstrated they were independent and largely free from external control, except for Julie Ward Howe, who had to struggle with her husband. So we can go on to the next slide. I would like to close with the words from Clara Barton, who it seems to me summed up the impact of the Civil War on these women, as well as other women. Clara Barton said, only an opportunity was waiting for women to prove to man that she could be in earnest, that she had character and firmness of purpose, that she was good for something in an emergency. The war offered her this opportunity. All right, there's my, uh, there's my advertisement. Better Angels available hardcover, Kindle, and in audio format. And then the next slide invites questions. For the women that published and made money off of books and music sales, did they get the money or did their husbands take it? Um, well, actually that was only a, a case, uh, in one case, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe received a, a lot of money and she and her husband, who was a um, theology instructor who never made very much money, they kind of pooled whatever resources they had and they bought a home in Florida. So they never, she never handed it over to them, but they used the money to buy something that they could share. Um, and I think Julia Ward Howe was pretty parsimonious uh, with her money. I don't think she handed it over to Dr. Howe. He made a good living on his own, so he didn't need uh, the money. And in fact, it probably even would have indicated to him that he was accepting money from her poetic endeavors, which uh, ran chills up and down his spine when he thought about it. So I, I think that the short answer is they, they didn't turn money over. Um, Harriet Tubman wasn't, she was married, but when she went back to, to get her husband, he had married another woman. So that relationship fell apart. She didn't get married to much, much later in life. So that wasn't an issue with her giving money over. Uh, Clara Barton didn't have a husband to give it over to. And Sarah Josepha Hale was a widow. And um, she used that money to educate her children, her five children. So I think with that one exception, um, they kept their money. I have uh, been a native of Bethesda, Maryland all my life. And I have always understood that a house on old Georgetown Road was the house Uncle Tom's cabin occupant at the time was the sort of the basis for Uncle Tom's cabin. Is that true? Well, partially. Um, it, it was lived in by a man who wrote the book, and I'm going back to check my notes here to make sure I've got his name absolutely. Josiah Henson lived in that house, and he wrote a book about slavery. And Harriet uh, Beecher Stowe, um, I won't say she... <laughs> pirated things, but she used it as her source material. Let's call it good research. So a lot of her facts came from Josiah Henson's book, uh, but it was not Uncle Tom's Cabin, unless you really stretch the, the meaning of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Mm -hmm. That cabin is now a park in Montgomery County. Yes, and it's the first place. I went there when I was first starting this book and I came across the key that I mentioned, which is her book, which, ju which justifies what she wrote in Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it was a wonderful find. There's a reproduction book uh, version of it being sold. And of course, now they're closed. But when they're open, I would suggest if you're interested in all at all in, in uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe and her writings, that that's worthwhile. Um, and it's not that expensive. Uh, the key is, uh, is available there in their bookstore. Is Gary with a question? Yes, Gary. Uh I was in the movie that was recently released about nine months ago about Harriet Tubman and uh, in uh, several of the scenes, uh, they called her the general. Uh, uh -huh. And that's it, I believe the part where she did led the raid. I don't think she was officially in charge or really a general at all. Well, but uh, obviously the military followed her lead and she knew what she was doing is what I she understand. Knew what she, was, she knew what she was doing. Actually, it was the first recorded instance of her being called general was John Brown. He referred to her when he visited her in St. Catharines, Ontario. He referred to her as General Tubman. And uh, maybe it was a way to woo her, to get her to, you know, to, to join his group uh, to do the raid on what was then Virginia. Uh, Harper's Ferry, now West Virginia, but um, it, it, if it, the attempt was to woo her, it didn't work. Uh, she saw through that his, uh, his planning was, was not that great. 
and I don't know if you saw the movie or not, but was it uh, historically accurate uh, from the little bit I knew about it? It didn't seem to be bad, but you know, Hollywood embellishes to get well, more sales. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I think it was a wonderful movie because it depicted the uh, fervor of Harry Tubman, her, um, her insistence on going back again and again, it portrayed that very well. I have two objections to it, which is Hollywood. One is, uh, if any of you have seen the movie, this is not a spoiler alert, I don't think, but she jumps off a bridge to escape some slave catchers. She never did that. Um, she did escape some people who were trying to give her a hard time on a bridge, but she really kind of conned them. <laughs> she talked her way through it. So that was not true. And there's another instance where she shoots a slave catcher. Uh, there's no recorded instance of her shooting uh, a slave catcher. However, one thing I didn't mention, which is in the book, is she carried uh, a pistol. And what she told those people that she was leading to freedom, the innocent slave people, you do not leave this band of people because dead men will tell no tales. She was willing to shoot anybody who was willing to turn around and go back uh, because she knew it would jeopardize, jeopardize the Underground Railroad as well as the people she was trying to say. There is absolutely no record of her ever having to shoot any of her uh, charges uh, in going north but it does make an interesting story. Bob, if, if, if you saw the, the uh, recent uh, movie about John Brown, Good, <coughs> Good Lord Bird, uh, I think it was called. Yeah, I, they, I've heard about it. What, what, what's what, your take on it? What, well, what, the, scene, the, the incident you're talking about where Brown goes to Canada, mm -hmm. they show that, and they, she's a character in that movie too. And, yeah. And Ethan Hawke, who plays Brown, he goes to the they show that in Canada where he goes and tries to convince her to become part of this thing. And uh, of course she doesn't cook. And they also have Frederick Douglass as a character and he obviously yeah. Douglass turns him down too. How in the movie did they depray, uh, display the fact that she did not, didn't want to uh, accompany John Brown? How do they? Well, I, I, I can't remember the exact details, but she she's pretty adamant that she didn't think it was a very good idea. No. And 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 for sure, Doug, the way they do, depict Douglas, the guy the guy who played Douglas is a guy who the guy who was the original uh, Jefferson in uh, the play Hamilton. If you yeah. saw that, <laughs> he he was great. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was pretty clear. Not in answer to your question. I'm only speculating, but I, I would guess that none of these women smoked or drank, which may may have something to do with their longevity. <laughs> absolutely, oh yeah, uh, absolutely not. No, there were no smokers or drinkers, and I'm sure they <laughs> ate very well balanced, uh, good meals. <laughs> but but with the exception of um, Harry Beecher Stowe, they all lived to be ninety or old. So, and, and my other question is: Is it not true that? John Brown's body was not actually talking about the John Brown initially. It was a guy who was in the Massachusetts militia whose name was John Brown. Well, that's right. There's, there's <laughs> a, there is a, uh, a sort of a contradictory theory that John Brown was a sergeant in uh, Massachusetts regiment and uh, it has nothing to do with John Brown of uh, John Brown's raid fam. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of things that get twisted in history. One of the things uh, that, I, that I always like to talk about, and in fact, I put it in my blog, is unfortunately today, the concept of the term Uncle Tom has this, uh, has this terrible implication. Uh, but in the book, there is no Uncle Tom behavior like we've heard it today. Uncle Tom was a very brave, um, honest, straightforward uh, man who wasn't uh, subservient in any respect. In fact, there's a professor at Columbia University who's done a big study on Uncle Tom's Cabin, and she said all of these Uncle Tom characters came out of stage and minstrel shows that came after, which incidentally uh, were done without Harry Beecher Stowe's um, permission. Um, the, the patent uh, requirements in those days were very poor. So all of these plays that were done, she never got a nickel for them, nor did she have any say over what, what they put in them. Uh, 
Um, so these were minstrel shows done after the Civil War, and that's where the the Uncle Tom, the unfortunate Uncle Tom that we hear about today, where that got its birth, uh, but not um, not with Harriet Beecher Stowe. The, the, the dilemma here, of course, is, uh, you know, when you approach a publisher about these five women, they say, well, you know, lots of things have been written about them, but nobody's ever taken this angle about how, what, what kind of a role they played. And of course, one publisher early on that both my agent and I decided we'd drop immediately. Well, what if we brought the women all together in the same room? <laughs> I said, no. No, we're not going to do that. The only contact that uh, that those five women had were uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote for Sarah Joseph Hale's publication, but you know it was it was sending stuff back and forth in, in the mail. Other than that, there was no other contact that I could find between or among those women. Uh, Bob, uh, there's a painting of Clara Barton. Um, at the Battle of Antietam, I think it's called the Angel of Mercy. Have you seen that painting? And uh, I presume she was really there um, outside of this large bar to the wounded. Can you talk about that? Well, well she was, yes. I have not seen that painting, but um, she worked with, and, and John, you probably know this. Dr. I do. <laughs> Dr. Dunn was at, the, was at the battlefield, and he wrote James home. L, James L. Dunn. James L. Dunn. He wrote home to his wife and said, that this woman outranked in his mind in terms of what she had accomplished, uh, George McClellan. Uh, he called her the angel of the battle. Yeah, I have his letters and in his letters, he writes that to his wife. Yeah. You're, you're, it was the Poffenberger farm at Poffenberger Antietam where she was. Yep. There, there actually is a, if you go up to Antietam, there's actually a monument there. The, the reason that she actually was in Geneva uh, was because her doctor told her she needed to, in those days, they tell her, said, go to Europe, you know, take a trip. Yeah. And, and she had met this guy, uh, Jules Goulet, in, in the war. He, had, he was a Union Army soldier, but he's from Switzerland. And he said, my father's a judge on the Supreme Court in Switzerland. Go stay with him, which she did. <laughs> And the Red Cross people heard that Clara was in, in Geneva and they came to visit her and they basically said, yeah, let's start the Red Cross in the United States. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, I understand is, what I understand is when Clara went to uh, Geneva was when she closed down what we now know as the, her hidden office or, and uh, the one that uh, they discovered later on. And so I don't know if anybody's well, been there, but that, I found that. No, no, that's what we're talking about. That you can... It's open Thursday through Sunday. Missing Soldiers Office. Yeah, it's been refreshed. It looks better than when Clara was there. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, in your research, uh, you obviously cover the big five, but are there any women you might have run across that deserve at least honorable mention that besides just these five? Well, I get, I get that question a lot. And I, I guess my, my determining factor was what did they accomplish? And what is the legacy that they left behind? And, and I kept coming back to these five. Nobody else had the legacy and the accomplishments. Bob, did uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe ever protest those versions of her book? Not to my knowledge, okay, which is really you. unfortunate because I think she takes, she takes the heat on this. Um, you know, why did she write this horrible uh, character in her book? Well, it wasn't her, but I don't think she had any at that point, she didn't have any um, recourse. People could basically do what they wanted to do. Um, you know, we're going to take your book and turn it into a play. Great. But do I get any say in what you do in that play? No. You know, go get a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Today they would. Yeah. <laughs> Today they would, and they'd have great grounds. But uh, in those days, there wasn't. Uh, well, even in fact. Um, Sarah Josepha Hale was one of the few editors of magazines that paid their writers. Uh, a lot of these magazines would just go snatch stuff up out of other magazines, particularly if it was written over in, in England, and they would just plop it in their magazine. They would never pay any kind of royalty fee for using it. So it was a kind of a, a humbling experience, I think, to be an author in those days and, and maintain some integrity. 
they they spent a lot of time looking for food and drinking it. (laughs) (laughs) And trying to keep warm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well? Well, Kurt, are you still there? I wanted to see if you had anything else to say, but... Uh, no, I had internet problems. My computer crashed. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> I'm not doing that again. We're no. going to have a bake sale and get Kurt a new computer for Black Friday. <laughs> yes. Maybe Santa will bring it to him. That would be nice. Harry Zerwick, do you have any other questions? And I just wanted to correct the record. Uh, the painting of Clara Barton at Antietam is called Island of Mercy. Island of Mercy, okay. Yeah, you've probably Angel. seen it perhaps. Not Angel of Mercy. Yes, Island of Mercy. Yeah, I'm looking right at the painting. It's a lovely painting. Yeah. We haven't looked it up. Yeah. And, yeah, but Bob's really right about, about Clara with, with, as a purveyor of medical supplies and assisting surgeon. She was much more than just, she wasn't really just a nurse. <laughs> She did a little nursing, but she did a lot more than that. Yeah. Well, I think you can validate this, John, but I believe that the Dunn and the surgeons at um, Antietam were were binding wounds with corn. They were. We Mm. talk about that. Um, One of the things he says that she she really saved their bacon is she brought lanterns (laughs) so they could operate at night. (laughs) Yep. Yep. So the he worked with her like at three different, Cedar Mountain was the first time he worked yes, with her. Yes, and, and he was very surprised when she pulled up in a wagon at Antietam and she got out with her. Yeah, uh, it was, it was Miss Barton was there again. Yeah, yeah Miss Barton's there again. Mr. Plum, what was the name of your Revolutionary War book memoir again, please? Oh, no, the, my, my, my book is called, um, you, you're talking about my, my relative or my yeah. versus the better angels, five women who changed civil yeah, war. Yeah, my earlier book is Your Brother in Arms about uh, George Presley McClelland with a D on the end of his name. I, I'm not sure what the uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. It's like, it's like um, Yankee Doodle, something or other. Uh, they've yeah. changed changing the name. But my book is Your Brother in Arms, and it's based on 42 letters. From a soldier who fought from, well, he was at Antietam, but they, they were brought in and they just sat there cooling their heels. Joseph Thanks. Martin memoir. Yeah. No, it looks like Melanie LaForce had some questions too. Melanie, do, do you want to open your mic? Yeah, yes. trying to <laughs> trying to remember. It, it just seems that, that uh, the, this period in time uh, in American history brought a lot of women into roles that were not the traditional housewife, mother, uh, child bearer, you know, like there, there were the vivandier, you know, the women who fought, and then there were uh, just women doing a lot of things outside the home. I'm wondering if there are other factors here. Is it the men going off to fight so there's nobody around to get stuff done? And so, you know, women were called upon to fill in the place or were these women did they have a lot of servants and so they were freed up from um the burdens of housework uh, inventions were there machine inventions well i think it's different for each one of the five that i talk about but generally speaking before the civil war there were uh, a lot of people heading west and the women who headed west with their spouses wound up being very independent people because they had to be um, they were on their own out there. Uh, there were also women who worked in factories in New England, uh, and that gave them like, some credibility, some some sense that they were accomplishing something. So they probably had more um, spirit to do things. They were really, you know, working against the uh, working against the curve on this because uh, women were supposed to be taking care of their children, raising children, and not doing things like writing poetry and um, caring for, for wounded soldiers. So it was an uphill, well, huge uphill battle. The, 
they they had to if you got your kid to live to five years old and their chances of living to adulthood well that yes and and you were blamed i mean as a woman if you if your children didn't if they died or got sick and died you were blamed for it you were responsible i mean it was a heavy burden well and And, exactly that that ties in the role that women were seen as before the civil war was well women of course they could be teachers they're they're teaching their children of course they could be nurses because they're nursing their their sick children so that kind of gave them an avenue to do some things that probably professionally would have been a real tough road to hoe without yeah. having, you know, family experience in working with sick children or um, caring for elderly parents and that kind of thing. But uh, like Seneca Falls was in 1848. So the suffragist movement was active, but then during the Civil War, it sort of went into abeyance and then didn't come out again. So, yeah. It's kind of and I know this sounds like a blatant advertisement, but I talk about the role of women, including the Seneca Falls, uh, in my book. Because yeah, I didn't I want think... to just jump into the Civil War. I mean, wow. it, needed, it, needed a, it needed a wind up of what was happening in the United States. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I thank you very much for your attention and your great questions. I always enjoy the questions. But, but by the way, the name of the book is very imaginative, Memoir of a Revolutionary Soldier. Okay, well, it used to be called Yankee Doodle something or other at one point, but I guess, yeah, that's quite a creative title. Yeah. Uh, there's one note uh, from Doug Krosick. I know I'm mispronouncing that most likely. Doug, do you want to ask, uh, you have a quote and you had a question? If you want to unmute yourself there. Um, His question, he said, to quote director John Ford, when you had to choose between history and legend, print (laughs) the legend. In previous writings focused on these respective women, was there more legend than history written about them? Well, I would say that the um, the biographies that have been written in the last 20 years are legend, almost 100% legend free. There have been some really good books written about uh, Julie Ward Howe, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Clara Barton, um, some terrific books written about Harriet Tubman. Um, those are legend free. So if you read books done within the last 20 years, you're going to get some really good history. Um, not so much with Sarah Josepha Hale. Unfortunately, not much has been written about her. Um, but the other four women have some terrific, absolutely terrific biographies written about them. And they are written by historians, not uh, people who are creating legends. But in the very, but in the very beginning, after once, once they had the publicity, was a lot of the legend published uh, in the newspapers or in the pamphlets about these individuals? To some extent. Um, kind of, I mean, like the like the West, I mean, Billy the Kid and, you know, and, and yeah. Jesse James and, well, and, and the tabloids. All of these women did a lot of writing and speaking so that a lot of the things that were written about them were taken from their speaking engagements or from things that they had written. Now, Harriet Tubman was not literate, so, but she right. gave great talks. I mean, she didn't write, but she, She was interviewed by a biographer um, in the 1860s, 1860s, um, Sarah Bradford. And unfortunately that Sarah used, you know, whenever she referred to Harriet Tubman, she wrote her sentences in dialect, which I think is abominable. Um, But nevertheless, she was a firsthand uh, recorder of Harriet Tubman's life. And uh, what she put down was right from Harriet Tubman's lips. So I think for the most part, these people either uh, sort of wrote their own biographies or they were speaking and people um, heard them often enough. So they were, that's not to say that when you speak and you talk about your past history that you don't maybe throw in a few uh, exaggerations. But I think for the most part, uh, if you look at the books in the last 20 years and the things that have been written about these five women, they're they are very accurate. Thank you. The name was pronounced perfectly. It is Krosik. <laughs> you, you nailed it. 
Okay, thanks. Um, I when I got, got cut out, I couldn't read the previous chat questions, but uh, there may have been some at the very beginning of your presentation. Uh, John, can you read to see if there's anything in the chat or? Well, the class? last one is the last one is just about John the John Ford quote. Okay, I mean at the very beginning. <laughs> at the beginning, we have. Oops, uh, uh, Jane Stewart Woolsey ran the Fairfax Theological Seminary Hospital. We have a comment. And then we did talk about Dorothea Dix and uh, Phoebe. Oh, no, it's Phoebe Pender. Phoebe Yates Pender, I think, is what somebody was talking Pender, about. The, yeah, she the, the Southern nurse who ran the hospital in Richmond. She, right, was, she ran a hospital. Was one of the matrons at, at the one of the wards of Chimborazo, but she she wrote her her diaries were published. I've read her. Phoebe her name is Phoebe Yates Pender. What about the woman who was the surgeon? She's buried at Arlington. Mary Cemetery. Walker. That's Mary, Mary Walker. Walker. Yeah, we have. And there's another one who was a spy. Well, Mary was Mary was a spy mm -hmm. also. She, she, had, she, she did all kinds of escapades. So we, we have her instruments on display at the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Cool. John Anderson asked, are there any outstanding Confederate women that should be mentioned? She, well, one, I would say Phoebe Yates Pender, if you're talking about nurses. Mm -hmm. um, trying to think of other Confederate women. Kate Cummings is another one that comes to mind. These are Paul the, Whitaker didn't join us, but she, yeah, Paula's book is about uh, what's her name uh, from Alexandria. Why am I? Why is what the stapler lead beater apothecary that there's supposedly, um, was it the, the, the woman who ran? She was a Quaker Methodist, she ran the apothecary there at, in Alexandria. But she was Never a well known. The Green Hotel. It was the Green Hotel, but down the street, you know, where where the stable led meter well, is today. The, uh, was the Mansion House Hospital. Uh, that was the that was the uh, uh, Mercy Street. That was the basis of Mercy Street. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's that. There was a Quaker though. Um, ah. He, uh, he, he invented the first was he, you know, in his family, there are a lot of women in his family who are like really active. Um, oh, the whole family ran the underground railroad at Lloyd House behind, it was a sugar refinery. They hid them in the vats. They pretended to be cleaning them out and then they, they'd hide them and then they'd get them down to the wharf and up to Baltimore. Um, Julia, I can't remember the family. Julia name. Wilbur was the, um, Paula's book. Julia Wilbur. Julia Wilbur? Yeah. That's right. She did nursing, I think, in Alexandria. Trying to search. Well, and then you, you had the uh, Claire, she got involved with women's suffrage a little bit too. <laughs> Claire Barton did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a split with the suffragists about <clears throat> getting the vote for the black male slave. <laughs> and, you know, it, you know, the, the three amendments to the constitution that marched towards uh, you know well, the, the, freedom and emancipation you know emancipation the and, the voting board, especially. and then the women always especially <laughs> black women always having to take the back seat yep. <laughs> until all the way to 1920 <laughs> and then the voting right acts of 1964 so yeah <laughs> i'm trying to search here well Well, John, if there's any more questions, I'd be glad to take them. And uh, if not, I think I'll uh, check out. I don't want to leave any question unanswered, but. Uh...
Thank you, Robert. Love, it was excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much.